So good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this early evening, uh, late afternoon session. I'm Bernard Prendergast from London, as I think you know, and it's a great pleasure to be joined by an expert team of colleagues who are going to be looking at the complete spectrum of uh, valve disease and ways in which we can manage it, manage it using emerging novel technologies. If I could have my first slide, please. So by way of introduction, I want to emphasize to you all that valve disease remains a major global challenge. These data from the World Health Organization demonstrate the fact, firstly, that rheumatic disease, calcific aortic disease, and degenerative mitral disease remain very common, that their prevalence, in fact, is increasing, and that mortality is on the rise. Furthermore, as we sit here in London, we should remind ourselves that in disadvantaged countries, Africa, South America, and major parts of the Asian subcontinent, that there are still very high mortality rates relating to valve disease as a result of the under-provision of care. I think we all know and we all recognize that valve disease is on the rise and it will continue to remain the case as our populations age with projections that the number of patients with valve disease will double between now and 2050. And we are also, of course, all very familiar at this meeting of the major steps forward along the road of transcatheter valve intervention, which now offers a comprehensive array of devices which are suited to treat our patients and their complex clinical needs. I shall be chairing this session with Jörg Kempfert from uh, Germany, and will be assisted by Philippe Genereux from the US, who will be acting as a chapmaster and also one of our speakers. We have a case, and we will have uh, help with the analysis of the case from Victoria Delgado in Spain. And we have three speakers who will be speaking on the aortic valve and tricuspid valve, Augusto Donforio from Italy, Hélène Alchaninoff from France, and Fabian Praz from Switzerland. And in this session, we are going to be focusing on three separate technologies, the Inspirus surgical valve, the Sapien Aortic Tavi Valve, and the newcomer on the block, the Evoke Tricuspid System, with the uh, facility of a recorded case. And in the session, we hope to explore how the patient's needs drive technology, a fundamental concept, how innovations can enable sophisticated treatment options and integrate with the discussions of a heart team to offer the most appropriate treatment choice for each individual patient. And also maybe if we have time to talk about how we address the challenges of multiple valve disease, uh, which is a frequent challenge in the elderly population. So that is our objectives, and we want to interact freely with our audience, Jörg. How are we going to do that? Yeah, it's the usual story. So if you are virtually connected, then please use the built-in chat functionality. We have a dedicated chat master here with us, and we try to uh, incorporate your comments and questions as much as possible. If you're here in the room, please feel free to go to one of the microphones to get the uh, interaction going. So the program is packed as usual. From a German perspective, I have to say we definitely need to finish on time because they're quite important important soccer game tonight. So without further ado, I would suggest we start with the first presentation, Bernard. Huh? So yeah. Augusto, Augusto is going to uh, focus on the new tissue that we now have available in Europe for uh, surgical um, uh, prosthesis and uh, also on the horizon for transcatheter from a European perspective at least. So Augusto, please. So thank you, Jörg. Dear colleagues and friends, it's uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, Edwards for inviting me today. It's a big honor and privilege to be here and to share the podium with such a distinguished faculty. This is my uh, disclosure. So according to the most recent guidelines, surgical aortic valve replacement is indicated in patients under 75 years and at low surgical risk. This means that we are talking about patients whose life expectancy potentially exceeds that of a surgical <coughs> bioprosthesis. And furthermore, we are observing a progressive reduction of mechanical prosthesis implantation in favor of bioprosthesis. For this reason, 
uh, the two most important aspects when a surgeon plans uh, aortic valve replacement are, first of all, the appropriate device selection <clears throat> in terms of tissue. Not all tissues are the same, and I'm going to show you why. And also in terms of valve design, and in particular, hemodynamic performance of the uh, bioprosthesis that we're going to choose at the, and the possibility to perform a valve in valve in the future. Another important aspect is uh, to select an appropriate technique, and in particular the most appropriate technique for each single patient. Minimal invasive uh, procedures and also annular enlargement, unfortunately, are uh, underutilized so far, and we have to do our best to improve these aspects, because it's very important that when a patient comes out of the OR, uh, this patient doesn't have patient prosthesis mismatch, because this, is, uh, this has an important important impact in uh, under um, clinical outcomes and also has uh, an important impact in terms of valve durability. So let's start talking about uh, tissue. It seems that if you are French and if your first name is Alain, you have a natural talent for heart prosthesis, right? So, um, in fact, if Alain Cribier paved the way for transcatheter aortic valve implantation, Alain Carpentier and his wife, uh, Sophie, developed the idea of glutaraldehyde-treated tissue valves in order to reduce the denaturation of uh, collagen tissue and also to reduce the immune host response okay, towards so the uh, tissue valve implanted. And in fact, they demonstrated that the cause of failure of this uh, first generation bioprosthesis was not related to the denaturation of the collagen, neither to the uh, immune response, but it was uh, calcification. And there are multiple factors that influence tissue calcification, and some of these factors are uh, related to the current technology. In fact, a side effect of glutaraldehyde fixation and storage is the creation of free aldehydes, and calcium binds to these free aldehydes and uh, leads to uh, structural valve deterioration. And so the residual tissue is a tissue that has a new integrity preservation technology that reduces uh, residual aldehydes that are um, implicated in the development of calcification. And this technology um, has uh, two main steps. The first one is uh, the stable capping of residual aldehydes in order to avoid calcium binding. And the second step is glycerolization that removes the water from the tissue and prevents further exposure to free aldehydes because the tissue does not need to be stored in a glutaraldehyde solution, but it's stored in dry conditions. And so the resilient tissue undergoes a first step, it's a glutaraldehyde stabilization as for all conventional valves, but then it undergoes this uh, preservation technology with uh, capping of uh, residual aldehydes and with glycerolization. And once the tissue is glycerolized, it can be stored in dry conditions and it's not exposed to uh, aldehydes anymore. This, this tissue was tested in a juvenile ship model that is an animal model that is used to um, evaluate tissue calcification and it has shown a significant reduction of calcium deposit both in the lab and also at the x-ray uh, examination as you can see clearly from the pictures uh, showed in this slide. Uh, if we talk about design, well, uh, we know that there have been many improvements in terms of bioprosthetic uh, design, and in particular, these improvements uh, led to uh, an increase of durability. And this is a very famous paper that shows very long-term outcomes of the perimount valve in aortic position. This is a study that included 2,700 patients with a follow-up to 25 years. And as you can see, even in the um, youngest uh, patient population below uh, 60 years of age, after 18 years, 50% of these valves are still well functioning. So this is the durability benchmark of surgical aortic bioprosthesis against which all new devices should be compared. The, the Inspiris Resilia aortic valve uh, prosthesis combines the properties of the perimount valve design together with the uh, Resilia tissue and also has a new stent design with a technology that is called V-Fit that enables the stent to expand in case uh, valve in valve is needed in the future in order to gain uh, one size. 
and the potential uh, of this um, uh, technology, of this stent expansion technology, will be tested with the, uh, during the Invivity study that will include 50 patients with dysfunctional uh, inspiris valves who will need valve in valve in the future. And of course, we still don't have the uh, results of this study. The Inspiris Resilia valve has also been tested uh, in vitro uh, with this study that shows one billion cycle that correspond more or less to 25 years of use. And as you can see, there are no difference between the one billion valve and the new valve in terms of leaflet motion and also in terms of um, flow uh, patterns. Let's have a look now at the clinical data of the Resilia valve. These are the five years outcomes of the COMMENCE trial that, just, that were recently published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. Uh, the COMMENCE trial is a prospective multicenter ID study that includes nearly 700 patients with a mean age of 67 years and an expected follow-up of uh, 10 years. These are the five years results for 500 patients reached the five-year uh, follow-up and Freedom at five years uh, from all cause the operation was 99%. Freedom from study valve explant was 99%. And freedom from structural valve deterioration was uh, 100%. This is another uh, very recent study that was presented at the last European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgeon Annual Meeting in Milan a couple of months ago. It's the Endure uh, Registry. It's a prospective uh, registry that wants to evaluate the clinical outcomes of the Inspiris valve in patients, in young patients under 60 years of age. Uh, and in fact, the uh, mean age of these 400 patients that were included in this study was 53 years with a mean Euroscore of 1.5. So definitely a very low risk patient population with a follow up of uh, one year and a 20 year follow up authors did not show any uh, valve related death nor structural valve deterioration just one case of endocarditis that required uh, valve uh, replacement. This is another study, the resilience study, that wants to uh, evaluate the long-term durability of the Inspiris Resilia valve in young patients below uh, 65 years. And the interesting thing of this study is that it will use both clinical and imaging definition of structural valve deterioration. In fact, as you can see, there is an echo core lab and also a CT scan core lab, and the, um, the follow-up duration, uh, the expected follow-up duration is uh, 11 years. Uh, we have recently presented always at the ACTS annual meeting in Milan this study. It's a multicenter propensity weighted comparison of three generation of aortic bioprosthesis, conventional stented, new generation stented, and rapid deployment aortic valves. Uh, the aim of this study was to evaluate early clinical and hemodynamic outcomes of uh, conventional stented, and we analyzed the Magna Easy valve, 300 patients, new generation stented, Inspiris Resilia, aortic valve, 600 patients, and the rapid deployment into it elite valve 1700 patients. This is a, a big multicenter study with more than 30 uh, national Italian centers involved in this, uh, in this analysis, in this, uh, in this study. And we observed that uh, we did not observe any significant difference under a clinical point of view. But if we look at valve hemodynamics, we observed that the Intuity and the Inspiris valve have uh, similar gradients that are, that are significantly lower than those of the Magna Easy valve. And even if we are talking about a few millimeters of mercury that probably will not have a clinical impact, these gradients, this difference probably will, might have a clinical impact in terms of uh, durability and structural valve deterioration because we know that structural valve deterioration is related to uh, valve hemodynamics and to transvalvular gradients. So in conclusion, uh, device selection for us is of utmost importance, especially in patients with long life expectancy. And in particular, we have to look at valve durability, valve hemodynamics, and the possibility to perform valve in valve in the future, thinking about the lifetime management of aortic valve disease. The Inspiris Resilia provides excellent clinical and hemodynamic outcomes up to five years in vivo and up to 25 years in vitro. And there are still studies ongoing in order to assess long-term outcomes and also to evaluate the efficacy of the uh, potential uh, expansion of the stent of the VFIT technology for future valve-in-valve -valve procedure. So I would like to thank again you for your attention and Edwards for inviting me.
Thank you a lot, Augusto. Uh, quite an interesting platform, I have to say. But obviously, as surgeons, we might be a little bit biased. So, Bernard, from your perspective, could that be a platform that uh, could be very well suited for the, let's say, low-risk patient, maybe bicuspid folks that are not the primary uh, focus of uh, transcatheter valves? I think so, definitely. I mean, we need to remember that not every patient is suitable for a TAVI procedure you know, by virtue of their age, by virtue of their anatomy, by virtue of the, the coronary locations, for example. So we need to maintain a dialogue with our surgeons and make sure that we choose the right uh, treatment for each patient. We shouldn't just say you are greater or less than an arbitrary age and say, well, you go through that door or that door. We need to be far more intelligent and sophisticated about that. And of course, we, as we've been demonstrating during the day, the CT is very, very important, giving us the information that we need about valve anatomy. And there's no reason why an 81-year-old shouldn't have surgery if that's anatomically the right thing for them to have. If they're at very high risk of complications, for example, coronary occlusion has a very high risk of mortality in the cath lab. So if a patient is otherwise suitable for an operation, there's no reason why you shouldn't offer that to them. And we frequently do that as an outcome of our heart team discussions. A separate issue, of course, is whether the patient is happy to have open heart surgery. But that's, that's something that's else we definitely need to tackle. That's another story. And uh, Augusta was nicely pointing out that also we as surgeons need to do our homework and get more minimal invasive because usually this is then the tipping point in the discussion with the patient. But focusing again on the younger patients. So younger patient entails life, uh, longer life expectancy and then durability obviously is an issue. I mean, if the resilient tissue is going to uh, truly outperform, there's no scientific proof yet. We also have to... Uh, admit that. But what I personally find very intriguing is this V-Fit technology, because we have heard in the previous session about valve fracturing and all these uh, techniques that might uh, become required if you have a too small, in the interventional perspective, surgical valve implanted. So you imagine you have something that kind of gives you the space very easily. And even if you don't have the original OR uh, report, if you magnify it on the fluoroscopy, you can even see the valve that size that had been implanted. So, Augusto, we like to say in these lifelong discussions, the first cut is the deepest. So, uh, we as surgeons, I think we need to do our homework there. You as, uh, as you said, it's definitely crucial to select the appropriate valve and the appropriate surgical strategy. Uh, the possibility to combine annular enlargement with the V-fit can optimize uh, the valve in valve in the future. And also, as you said, Bernard, at the, at the very beginning of the discussion about the uh, elderly patient who can still undergo surgical AVR, it's uh, absolutely true. And in this patient, we can do our best to decrease the surgical impact by reducing, for, exa for example, the skin incision and also surgical time and aortic cross clamp time. And we can do this using rapid deployment valves. So if we think of an elderly patient that needs to undergo surgical AVR, why don't do a minimal invasive uh, approach with, um, with a rapid deployment valve in order to minimize the surgical, uh, the surgical impact and also to optimize both hemodynamics, because we know that the subannular link gives a lot of improvements in terms of hemodynamics, and also uh, reducing surgical cr times, cross cramp time, and cardiopulmonary bypass time. So all these aspects, if we put together all these aspects, for sure we can find the optimal surgical strategy also in a patient that theoretically could undergo TAVI or surgery. But we know that age per se is not a risk factor for even for surgical AVR. So uh, given that I'm sitting here between two surgeons, I want to ask you both about the, the threshold for use of a bioprosthesis. <laughs> because it seems to me, uh, forgive me, but it seems to me that over the last decade, surgeons have offered bioprostheses to younger and younger patients without really knowing about the data beyond 10 years. So how do we square that circle and, and how do you work out how to offer? What is your threshold for offering a mechanical versus a biological value? Yeah, no, the problem is that it's not us offering it, it's more the patient yeah. demanding it. So I often have discussions with very young patients. So I think it's a no-brainer to implant a 50-year-old tissue valve. I think even if it's not officially recommended, the cutoff uh, point is still 65, right? But I mean, 
this is an off the real world, but and we are talking here about 30-year-old patients. So even a 30-year-old patient starts typically discussion, can I not have a tissue valve, and then we do valve and valve and valve and so on. Uh, so the data is also not bad for a mechanical valve, and there also was a slight hope that it might work with a new anticoagulation system that is now doesn't seem to work as expected, we have to admit, right? So this is why the role of the tissue valve from my perspective, it's going to uh, even play an, a more incre uh, increasing role in the future despite the lack of the data, just because the patient has the preference. So the Resilia tissue is something that we hope for that it works. So we have Philip also from the US perspective. And do you think there's any chance you even might see it on a transcatheter platforms? Because we in Europe definitely have never heard of that. Yeah, so, so um, it's kind of breaking news, but we start to use it, uh, the Resilia tissue and a regular Sapien valve uh, two, three weeks ago. So this is our routine platform. So Sapien valve with Resilia tissue. So, um, so it's already there in the US. It's approved in the US, not in, not in Europe, I, I, I suppose. Um, for us, I, I think Bernard is, is, is like you said, um, it, it's very complex uh, what to choose for which patient. As a rule of thumb for us, we're very privileged to have a Ross surgeon in our institution. So everyone below 50 years old or 55 years old, we, we, we consider for Ross, we send, first of all, we do a CT scan on everyone, okay? So we know what we talk about, we don't speculate on what's gonna be good or not. And then 55 for me and below, you can consider a Ross procedure. Uh, and, um, and, and that's very variable from geography to geography. There's even surgeons that don't believe in it, but I, I strongly believe that if you have a good Ross surgeon, that should be uh, probably the best option. I think mechanical valves should not, I, I, I personally think it should not be done if you have a good Ross surgeon. And then between, you know, above, uh, if you cannot do a Ross, this is where I think if you have a good CAT scan, a big valve, TAVR versus um, tissue surgery should be the debate. Um, I have no problem to put S329 in an eye coronary patient. Um, this is where I believe tissue versus tissue, TAVR is the same as SAVR, as long as there's no iris feature. Um, you know, so, so this is for me, it's ROS or TAVR, and, and we can use surgery if there's iris feature for, ta for, for, for TAVR. This, this is my controversial. I, I would say that yeah, ROS is uh, it, it's great. I mean, we have great data about ROS, but it has two main limitations. The first one is related to uh, operator experience, of course, because ROS has good outcomes if it's done by uh, an expert operator. And this does not happen in all centers, especially in peripheral centers. And the second uh, limitation is related to um, uh, the short of uh, pulmonary homograft. So these are the two main limitations for the ROS procedure. Uh, for a TAV implantation in a very young patient, I have some concerns not related to the durability itself, but probably related to uh, the, op the possibility and the occurrence of, uh, for the need of an exp surgical explantation of that TAV in the future, for example, in case of endocarditis, if we reduce too much the threshold for TAV implantation in patients with young age, it will increase by far the incidence of endocarditis in this patient. And we have data from surgical TAV explant registries that uh, outcome after a surgical TAV explant is really bad. Mortality is up to 20, 25% but it's completely different for an explantation of a surgical uh, aortic valve bioprosthesis. And also there is the aspect related to uh, coronary access in very young patients. So there are still many issues that probably, in my opinion, limit at this moment the uh, use of TAVI in very young patients, like below 50, 65 or... We want to uh, get interactive. So if we have any question from the floor or comments, please identify yourself with the microphone. It might be a little bit hard to see because it's a little bit dark in the back, but we definitely will see if you raise your arm. We have a first question from the online audience. Right. And this is... Uh, something that we, I think we need to clarify, because the question is, if the VFIT technology of the Inspires platform can be used by means of balloon valvuloplasty to increase the orifice error in case the surgeon has implanted a too small valve, so PPM. And I think this is a misconception of the concept, yeah. because, I mean, the leaflet tissue is limited. If you kind of open up the valve frame, then definitely you're going to create a center Central leak. So the VFIT yeah. technology is only mm -hmm. meant to be used in the setting of a valve and valve instead of the uh, fracture. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So, Victoria, you still see a lot of echoes and a lot of patients. So, what's your perspective on the new valve platforms and the general discussion? What the surgeon should be, do better in terms of implanting the first uh, biological valve platform? 
So this discussion is really interesting because uh, we just uh, learned uh, one week ago, for example, publishing Jack, uh, the series of uh, US with more than uh, 145,000 uh, patients uh, treated with aortic valve replacement and seeing the trends according to the different years and according to the age of the patients and below 65, TAVI was almost 50% in last year. So that is quite interesting, particularly, for example, in Europe, that we had the guidelines that set the age limit around 75. And many countries now, for example, in Spain, we had the age limit 80 year old, and now we are adapting to 75. Perhaps going below 65 is too fast, because as you said, there is the issue, for example, on the coronary arteries, there may be more patients with bicuspid aortic valves. But on the other hand, to uh, continue thinking that you need to implant a mechanical valve, perhaps the age is not longer one of the only parameters that you need to take into account. And having, for example, valves that can uh, uh, host a larger valve um, limiting the risk of patient prosthesis mismatch could be an option. We know that mechanical valves have longer durability, but we also know which are the drawbacks of continuous use of anticoagulation. So this is something that needs to be well balanced and discussed with the patient. And of course, we need more data in order to see uh, the durability of these valves and how will we perform. So thanks, Victoria. We're about to move forward in the, the program. I just want to check, Jürgen, are there any other questions from the, the, the Not uh, at the moment, no. Room? And anything on the chat, Philippe? No. Okay. So thank you very much, Augusto. Thank you. Fantastic. And we'll now we'll invite Ellen Elchaninoff, who needs no introduction, to talk to us about the Sapien platform. Ellen, we, you will know, has been involved since the beginning of the story. And that means she has more experience with the Sapien platform, perhaps, than anyone else here at the meeting. So, Ellen, tell us about the revolution and tell us about the history story. Yes, thank you. So we'll move from uh, surgical bioprosthesis to a transcatheter balloon uh, prosthesis, and we'll try to have a look at the, the, the concept and move uh, to the future. So this year we are celebrating the 20 years anniversary of the first in-man implantation uh, performed by uh, Alain in Rouen. And you can see here the, the celebration. It was a great event with uh, more than 500 participants uh, in this, uh, at this anniversary. So this innovation is based on a clinical need and I think it's something which is important to remember because in the early 80s um, uh, there was a single goal. It was to provide a life-saving therapeutic options to patients who had symptomatic aortic stenosis and who were declined for surgical valve replacement. And it was not rare. Surgeons uh, operated only patients who were older than 70, uh, uh, younger than 70 in the, the 80s. So there were, it was an attempt to solve a major unmet clinical need. And without surgery, we know that mortality is very high, close to 80% at two years. So the, 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 the idea was to propose a stent-like technique for less invasive treatment for these patients who had declined to surgery. The start was balloon valvuloplasty in 1985, and the, the achievement was the TAVI in 2002. So how did it start? In fact, it started with balloon valvuloplasty, and uh, it, it had a great success with 10 of thousands of patients per formed worldwide, but quite fast it was obvious that there was early restenosis uh, after this procedure in about 80% of patients, and uh, Alain Cribier had either to abandon or to develop something else, and he had the idea of developing a stented valve because implanting a plant valve prosthesis within the diseased aortic valve using the calcification as an encore, and to do it on the beating heart using technique percutaneous uh, procedures and local anesthesia, again, for this uh, fragile uh, population. So the TAVI concept, in fact, was born to overcome balloon uh, valvulopasty restenosis. So it was a long journey from concept to fabrication. First of all, it was important to demonstrate the feasibility and uh, 
uh, it was uh, brought by the autopsy uh, studies in cadavers in patients dying from aortic stenosis, demonstrating that it was possible to implant a stent and to open it widely, pushing away the calcification, which was something which was not at all obvious, and especially for the surgeons. And then it led to drawings to a homemade prototype, which demonstrated that it was feasible to crimp a valve, a, a stent with a valve inside on a balloon, meaning that it was possible to use a transcatheter technique. Then uh, uh, it was important to try to find a company to develop something, and unfortunately it was not possible to find a, a company who accepted to do it. So they created a startup company with uh, Martin Leon and two engineers named PVT. This allowed to do a lot of experimental work in the ship with this prototype developed in Israel, in Iran. And uh, this uh, ship uh, experience in 100 sheep could demonstrate that it was feasible and that it was uh, possible to maintain the valve working for at least five months, which was the requirement for uh, FDA. And then, of course, you know, so in 2002, 20 years ago, there was this first in man who was a dying person, 57 years old. We, were, we had to do it using transeptal approach because the patient was so sick that he had occluded uh, arteries in the leg. But it was successful. You can see we did it uh, together with Alain Cribier and with Christophe Thon. We uh, were successful to implant this valve despite the transfemoral difficult access. And it led to a miracle with the disappearance of the transvalvular gradient with a gradient which was 10, a valve area of 1.7, publication in circulation, and you know uh, the continuation of the story. Edwards Life Sciences acquired the PVC startup in 2004, and it was the start of the big randomized trial for evidence medicine and evidence based uh, a demonstration of the efficacy of the Sapien uh, device. First of all, in comparison to medical treatment, and then in comparison to surgery in uh, high risk, intermediate, low risk. And each time these studies demonstrated either non-inferiority or superiority to a surgery uh, with a Sapien device, and it led to FDA approval each time and to uh, the guidelines. The last one were in 2021 in the US, in Europe. And again, of course, TAVI uh, was a class 1A for patients greater or equal to 75 years old, even at low risk and the surgery more for low-risk younger patients. So it was a big achievement. So what ha happened during these 20 years? It's an uh, incredible expansion worldwide, and the expected growth of 40% per year, which is huge. Today, we have 2 million procedures in 80 uh, countries. And uh, what are the reasons for such a success? I think it's quite clear. The two reasons, first of one, is that it is a stent-like procedure, meaning a local slip procedure which can be done on local anesthesia, like stent-like, really, no scar, fast procedure, short hospital stay, improved quality of life. And the second one is the incredible uh, um, uh, evaluation, scientific evaluation of the device across all the partner trials from uh, higher risk patients to lower risk. And this last one in uh, the partner three, demonstrating superiority uh, of S3 device over surgery at one year. So, the, of course, we have remaining issue, and uh, all the meeting will not be enough to discuss these uh, remaining questions around TAVI. We have durability, we have a coronary access, that the one I selected are the more important to me uh, today. Concerning durability, what we know that today, there is no signal for a difference versus surgery across registries or across studies. We have two randomized trials at five years, and you can see here the example of the partner two comparing or using propensity score analysis, the s sapien 3 device to surgery. No difference in structural valve deterioration at five years. We have also a study with a core valve at eight years. Again, no difference at eight years. Of course, we are expecting more and more results with a longer follow-up. 
The second question, which is uh, really uh, very important, is coronary access and the risk of coronary occlusion, which can be a, a big issue, especially if we deal with coronary patients and with younger patients. We know that it often co coexists, coronary disease and the aortic stenosis. Between 30 and 60 percent of patients will uh, have coronary disease. And we know the importance of design to maintain coronary access. It's very important, you can see on the right, uh, more than 95% of patients with Sapiens 3 have coronary access, which is very easy. You have uh, less and less when you go to the left, uh, particularly with self-expandable uh, devices. So what can we predict for the future? We can fu predict an expansion of TAVI related to several things, to technical advances, new TAVI systems, improved uh, procedural easiness, democratization in of, uh, sort of democratization of TAVI, growing number of patients with aging population, growing number of centers, operators, scientific and evidences across registries, randomized trial, new indications, leading to uh, probably uh, more uh, patients treated with new indications, decreased in TAVI costs, and improved AS dissection, the, the detection, because it's a big subject, to uh, uh, increase awareness. We know that there will be an increase in elderly population in the future, uh, multiplied by two or three within the next 20 years, so more and more patients with aortic stenosis. We know that we'll have a better detection, improved devices, new indications. Concerning the devices, uh, if we look at the Edwards Life Sciences, we are for, at the Sapiens 3. Already several countries have the Ultra, and we are coming to the Ultra Resilia. I, I heard that it was already implanted in the, in the US, and all the goals are to improve the results and to decrease the complications. So decrease the aortic regurgitation, which is already extremely low, stroke, a pacemaker rate, to have longer durability, to cover life management of patients. So all these are in the pipeline. So new indications also, it's something very new and very interesting. We have uh, three ongoing trials uh, on uh, comparing TAVI to surgery in moderate Yes, it's something very provocative, either in patients who are symptomatic with heart failure or depressed LV function. And we have also a study in asymptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis, which is also quite provocative. And all these studies are ongoing with long follow-up, and we will have the result <coughs> later on. So what are, in, I can say, probably my personal views on lifetime management of patients according to age in Europe, with, where life expectancy, uh, we know the life expectancy, we, we, ha we know that the patient probably will, will not get only one intervention, maybe two, three will be more complicated. And uh, I separated uh, um, by age. I think a patient who is elderly and uh, aortic stenosis is a disease of the elderly, so I think it, it's a major group. Uh, they will get a TAVI after the age of 75. Maybe they will need to have a second one, and probably the third one will never happen. They will not live for forever. If the patient are less than 65, uh, we discussed he can have a mechanism Nickel valve, which is, uh, will uh, keep forever usually. And if he gets a bioprosthesis, you have still two options. You, have, you can redo surgery and then do valve in valve. But if you do immediately valve in valve, what will happen with the third intervention? This is a question. And uh, in, of course, we can still keep TAVI for those who absolutely refuse surgery or who have contraindication to surgery. It's not very ca common, but it can happen. In between, we have the famous group the one between 65 and 74, and uh, the discussion is between uh, TAVI or bioprosthesis as a first procedure. And you can see, according to the one you first choose, uh, what can happen if you choose a TAVI, uh, if he needs secondary intervention, it can be surgery, and you can go for valve in valve. If you choose to go for second valve in valve, uh, again, it's, uh, we will have the question of the third one. And if you do a surgery with a bio prosthesis. Uh, you can, of course, also redo surgery, but if you do valve in valve, you can also face the, the third uh, difficulty, maybe uh, intervention. So to conclude, uh, within 20 years, uh, 
this uh, disruptive technology, which was initially considered impossible and insane, has known a considerable expansion based on continuous advanced technologies, leading to procedural facilitation, stent-like procedure, safety, together with outstanding scientific evaluation. And many investigations are ongoing to uh, answer the remaining questions, and uh, so should lead to a further accelerated expansion of this breakthrough technology in the future. Thank you. So thank you, Hélène. It was a masterpiece of a presentation and a really valuable perspective on a, an incredible clinical journey, but also importantly, an evidence-based clinical journey. And I, I can't uh, emphasize evidence-based uh, too strongly. Perhaps one question I wanted to ask you is, when do you think we will know about the durability of TAVI devices? We've got the five-year data that you've outlined. When will you feel comfortable knowing that our, the, the TAVI valves are as durable as surgical bioprostheses? I think we are already um, quite comfortable, but without evidence uh, data. Because, for example, if we look at our experience in Rouen, we started in 2002, we have more than 2,000 patients, and we have less than 10 cases of redo surgery or redo taver. Even, of course, you will tell me that they were very sick, they are at high risk, and they died from something else. But there is no uh, evidence of a signal to, to show something. So I know that all the studies, as, as the partners etc. They will have longer follow-up, but it will take time. But there is no, there is no signal to me. Okay. So Your? the durability was one issue, obviously, but it doesn't seem that they are bouncing, bouncing back quite frequently. I think no, no, nobody has this experience, so we shouldn't be too worried about this issue, I would say. Uh, what I found really intriguing was in the early drawing of 90, uh, end of 1995, uh, or whenever this drawing was, there was a skirt already included, yes. right? So this is really amazing that it took another 20 years to make it into uh, commercial approved uh, devices. And uh, we all know, since we have this amazing skirt, also the paravalve leak has practically gone away as long as you stay in the boundaries of, let's say, relatively accessible tricuspid valve and different story about these nasty bicuspid valves. So my limitation of, from, from me surgically also, and also I do TAVI also myself, is I'm definitely a fan of TAVI in a tricuspid landing zone. I don't see any issue of durability, but the pacemaker is still something that puzzles me and the, the, the gap in the evidence in regard to anticoagulation. These two points are something that for me are not really acceptable if we really want to go to younger patients. What is your take on that? I agree, and uh, studies are sometimes controversial, but it seems clear that when you have a pacemaker, it will have an impact on, mort on mortality and on heart failure. So it's better not to get a pacemaker. So um, you have uh, devices who are with less pacemaker than another one, and of course it's better to get uh, a rate which is uh, close to less than 10 and as low as possible, I agree. And uh, the other one, uh, the, other was a the anticoagulation. The anticoagulation. Um, I, I mean, we have some informative data that when you have anticoagulant therapy for AF, for example, you don't need to add aspirin, so you will not increase the bleeding risk. Concerning those who don't need anticoagulant, they are on aspirin alone. And for example, I know that in our area, we are planning and accepted a study comparing only three months of aspirin versus no aspirin. So again, maybe it's something toward less uh, risk of bleeding. So um, I'm sure because with surgical bioprosthesis, you don't need a uh, long life um, use of aspirin. So maybe it will be the same for TAVI. And also for the surgical valve, we don't truly know the full picture. When you look at the CT-based study, you have the hold issues and something that's all things are not so easy to understand. I mean, what is your practice in the US? Yeah, so... Um, Dual platelet or...? No, only no. baby aspirin. So um, if, if there is a NOAC or a Coumadin, we stay with Coumadin and uh, NOAC for other indication. If it's a valve and valve is maybe difficult, but, but it's still baby aspirin for everyone. So um, I just want to come back on your question of pacemaker, I think that's very interesting. Also, left bundle branch block is a problem. You know, those patients have dyssynchrony, they don't do well, they come back with heart failure. But I think I really like your perspective um, that you give. We start with very sick patient, 
a lot of LVOT calcium, a lot of calcify valve, and we oversized those valves at the beginning like crazy. Um, now we, we start to do X4 in US uh, under a trial, and we don't oversize that much. Um, we put the valve higher. Um, we go to healthier patients. So I think, and, and then we start to moderate the AS patient, the progress trial, and we see there's not a lot of calcium. Those valves are great. It's like a bench test model. There's valve opening, there's no gradient, there's no leak. So I think the reality is I think we've been you know, playing with patients so sick at the end of the spectrum, um, not surgical candidate, and then we say, oh, there's a leak, there's a pacemaker, there's left bundle, but we forgot how, how sick those patients are. So I think with more advanced technologies, such as X4, et cetera, um, and playing with patients, maybe earlier in the game, I think we might see uh, where we want to be, so. That's really fascinating, Philippe, and I just wanted to pick up thinking about the future demand for TAVI because Hélène has outlined the growing numbers, the elderly population, the new emerging indications. Perhaps we could bring in Fabian here. How are you going about delivering the demand for TAVI in a high volume service in Bern, Fabian? Are you using more operators? Are you moving to a hub and spoke model where simple TAVI is done in Referring hospitals and complex procedures are done in your hospital. H how you are solving this demand supply mismatch? So you know what what we have been doing and what has been one of the big work around this program is to really streamline the procedure and and get you know a, a certain number of patients done at the same day. And you know, I think conscious sedation is of course one of these uh, very important aspects. So we do um, almost I would say more than 90% of our TAVI in conscious sedation with uh, only fluoroscopy guidance, and that has been really pivotal to increase uh, the capacity of the hospital to do. Uh, to do enough TAVI. Obviously, the, the demand is, uh, is increasing, of course, and, um, and I think streamlining it is, uh, is important. We don't do now um, an, um, you know, short hospitalization uh, in, in a systematic way, but I'm aware of some center uh, developing this and, and treating this patient in an ambulatory way or 24-hour hospitalization, and that's also certainly something um, that is uh, possible today with all what we know. You know the, Bernard, you emphasize the evidence around this, but you know we know a lot of this patient. We can predict uh, which patient will get a pacemaker in a quite accurate way now, and uh, I think all this uh, streamlined the procedure a lot during the last years. Do you have the same approach in Rouen, Helen? You still Tavi is still done in the centre. You're not democratizing it to smaller hospitals? Uh, it's, in fact, it's, uh, we are not allowed in France. Ah. We're not allowed to, TAVI is not allowed in centers without uh, surgery, but there is a lot of discussion because uh, big centers without surgery on site would like to do the procedures because they have to go to the expert hospital to do them. Uh, but the problem is that uh, to which center do you, which one are allowed, will be allowed to do it because uh, everyone will, 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 will desire to do it and uh, it's difficult to cannot leave anyone do the TAVI and indications etc discussion with the heart team will disappear so uh, it's a big discussion in France have at to least. Be careful. And, and if I may in Germany I know it's been a controversial topic. It has been but uh, I mean in Germany uh, it, no matter where you live in Germany your next TAVI center is 20 minutes by car so this is not a problem that you really need to open more centers. I know there's economical reasons behind that, but also we should not forget that these superb results we are seeing in the larger registry is also based because of the concept that these procedures are done in high volume yes. centers. Yeah? It's not that we do it better than other physicians. I just say what you do often, you do good. So maybe before we change the topic, mm. we should in, uh, discuss one uh, another comment from the online audience. So the question, this is a really one. How small analysts, so how the problem of a small analyst contributes to the hard team decision making, Sava versus Tava in a uh, first procedure in a younger patient, meaning less than 65. I mean, this is something that definitely is um, not so easy because if you discuss Tavi at this age, yeah, then most likely you should also think of supra annular concepts, but they are not well suited for coronary access, they're not well suited for valve and valve, right? On the other hand, surgically, it's also not so easy to deal with this, especially not if you want to go for a minimally invasive procedure. But as a matter of fact, I would say if the low risk, Augusto, would you agree with me, we go yeah, for absolutely. 
I annular enlargement, right? Yeah, absolutely, annular enlargement. Now we have the possibility to predict patient prosthesis mismatch. If we have a preparative CT scan, we can predict what is the, 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 the size of the surgical uh, valve that we're going to implant on that patient. And so we already know if uh, annular enlargement is needed in those patients. And we have to do all our efforts in order to avoid patient prosthesis mismatch. That's crucial, absolutely. But this also means that also for the younger surgical patient, they should be discussed in the heart team and they also ideally should have a CT scan. Because otherwise you only figure out in the OR and then it may be too late because it might require different operators, different strategies and so on. So I'm a big fan of CT for everybody basically. I mean for me that's the key point. If nobody's seeing me without a CAT scan, otherwise it's speculation. And especially for young people, I mean if you talk about a root enlargement, first of all you need to make sure that you have a small analyst and a surgeon who will be do it. Um, you know, so a CT scan is the key of the heart, it's the middle of the heart theme uh, discussion. Otherwise this is a very sterile debate. And we do re need to re-emphasize the point that Augusto made earlier, and I was going to ask him specifically, but now is the moment, that the next generation of surgeons need to learn root enlargement techniques, and they should be applied more widely. Would you agree, Augusto? Absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And if I may uh, comment on uh, Helene's presentation um, uh, regarding the gray zone patients between 65 and 75 years, Helene, I would like to leave a strong message to the audience. If uh, a TAVI is chosen as the first um, technique, first approach in these uh, intermediate age patients, these gray zone patients, uh, don't think about a Tavi, tavi, surgical TAVI explant in the future because, as I said, it can be a nightmare under a technical surgical point of view. So uh, you, you should do all your efforts in order to plan a valve in valve. So implant a valve that you already know that is going to be a good candidate for a future valve in valve and not a surgical explant. I think that surgical explant should not be um, expected after a TAVI procedure. It's something that is uh, bailout, out, but it not, should not be a um, program. This is uh, important because outcomes are bad. So in 50% of cases, you need to reconstruct the aortic root. And it's, you know, York, yeah. it's, it's, it's so terrible. We do agree in the next generation surgeons need to put in larger valves. They need to be aware of the CT imaging. They uh, <laughs> maybe also need to learn to put in transcatheter valve. At least I <laughs> learned that because we know that there's an increasing need of our patient and it matter, doesn't matter who does it as long as it's done in the right manner. So I think we need to stay in time, right, Bernard? We you know all, why. We always need to stay on time to keep you happy, you. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're now going to... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for Alain. Thank you. <laughs> So by way of transition, we're now asking Philippe just to set the scene in relation to the tricuspid valve before we evolve to the uh, recorded case element of the session. So Philippe. All right, so thanks again for uh, this kind of invitation. And um, I was always shocked to see the uh, under treatment of aortic stenosis uh, in US. 50% of the patient with severe AS as a class one indication are not treated. And then if we look at tricuspid regurgitation, we're gonna be even more shocked. So. Um, here is my disclosure. Um, a disclaimer that uh, Edwards wanted me to read is that all the opinion and my um, opinion will be mine and not uh, those of, um, the point of view will be not those of Edwards. So first of all, tricuspid regurgitation. So we know that uh, the more severe is tricuspid regurgitation, the higher chance of mortality. So there's a strong correlation with the regurgitant volume in the uh, ERO. So uh, there's clear mortality relationship between severity of TR and, and mortality. We also know that medical therapy for TR doesn't work. Uh, this is um, some data in the middle from the three uh, valve registry in US showing that when we repair the valve by, tri by, by transcatheter, you improve your mortality, your survival um, compared to medical therapy. One of the issues with tricuspid, those patients are very, very uh, uh, sick. They a lot of time have RV dysfunction, clinical or subclinical. Um, they don't do well with surgery. And you see on the right side of the graph, in spite of having increased volume um, with surgical the tricuspid valve repair replacement, uh, the mortality is still very high. And actually, the mortality is not improving year after years. So this is a little bit concerning. So those patients are very sick, uh, and we know they're um, 
um, they, are, they, are, they don't have great option, either medical therapy or surgery. And this is another example that when we divide TR as a trace, mild, moderate, severe, there's a clear relationship with, uh, with mortality, um, and the RV is not uh, able to tolerate this load. I mentioned that AS is under-treated in the U.S. And, and around the world. Well, look at this prevalence in the U.S. We have 2.4 million of patients with some sort of um, tricuspid regurgitation, and only 10,000 tricuspid surgery are performed in the U.S. So you, there's a big gap in terms of treatment. Obviously, those patients are sick. They have other valve disease. Um, not, only, not all the 2.4 million uh, will need a transcatheter valve, but there's a big gap in treatment. Um, and medical therapy doesn't work really. Some patients will improve, but they will come back and the disease will evolve, the annulus will enlarge and extra, etc. So clear unmet need and clear uh, a need for a transcatheter therapy, giving how sick those patients are and our surgery uh, is most of the time not the <coughs> ideal option. So tricuspid valve, uh, we all are going to agree, is complex, uh, much more complex than aortic valve or mitral. Um, there are dense chordae. Uh, the, there's variable variability in the leaflet. Sometimes there's three, there's four. Sometimes there's cleft, there's fold. And the annulus could be extremely large, especially when, when there's AFib and when there's long-standing TR, um, and, and pro really making a challenge in terms of valve, si valve sizing. Um, so now, um, actually, I'm going to turn to uh, Fabian Praz and Victoria. Fabian will present one of his <coughs> cases, and Victoria will be nice enough to comment. Um, and please read this disclo uh, the disclaimer. Um, this uh, valve is not approved in, 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 in Europe, neither in the US. Uh, that's going to be purely investigational. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Philippe, for the, for the introduction. Uh, I mean, you set the stage in a very nice way. Uh, so I would like to present now the case. I will do a very short presentation of the clinical context of this patient. Uh, we have treated in Bern with this. Uh, in the, the, the patient was treated in the TRICENT study, so it's a study patient. Um, and as uh, Philippe mentioned, it's not an approved device. We use uh, the, the EVOC uh, valve for treating this patient with severe secondary uh, regurgitation. So the patient is uh, 82 years old, uh, he is on permanent atrial fibrillation and it is the case in the vast majority of these patients, I would say about 70% of the patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation are on atrial fibrillation and as you can see this old patient has been already pre-operated so he had a surgical implantation of a me mechanical aortic valve prosthesis that was a long time ago, 97, and he developed uh, after that uh, symptomatic severe secondary tricuspid regurgitation and the main mechanism was annulus dilatation. We will come back in details on, on that uh, together with Victoria. And the patient has no relevant coronary artery disease. He presented to us with lower extremity edema. He had congested uh, jugular veins, and he had also shortness of breath, which is one of the first symptoms of uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So that the, the coronary angiogram, I promise you, uh, with uh, the normal uh, coronary arteries. And we did, as we do in all these patients, also a right heart catheterization. And you can see the value. So we have some kind of borderline pulmonary hypertension. The systolic uh, pressure is uh, 31. But this is, of course, underestimated in the context of uh, severe tricuspid regurgitation. The wedge value, and that's also something very important um, to look at. Uh, you see a patient with a mechanical mechanical aortic valve, so we need to look on the left side as well, um, and you see that the wedge was, uh, was not uh, so high, and on these uh, fluoroscopic images you can also see that we had a normal function of this uh, mechanical aortic valve. So that's uh, the imaging, and the first step, of course, is a transthoracic echocardiography. So you can see that this patient has a good function, so the left side is actually uh, in, a, in a good shape. We have severe tricuspid regurgitation, vena contracta is 9, um, and uh, we have also uh, a preserved right ventricular function. It's mildly uh, diminished. We can discuss this also with, uh, with Victoria, uh, but you see that all in, uh, all in one, uh, actually, uh, a good good function of the, of the right ventricle. And uh, finally, you see that we have a um, uh, dilatation on this echocardiographic images of the right ventricle, uh, but that's only one of the dimension, and uh, we will look at it uh, in more details. Here are some images of the transesophageal echocardiography with uh, the, the 
setup and uh, the screening we do, typically uh, you see a deep esophageal view and also the transgastric view to localize the, the, the coaptation gap and the location of tricuspid regurgitation. The device we will use is a transfemoral device introduced into the right ventricle. It's a 28 millimeter valve, um, inner diameter, uh, that is self-expanding. And you see the way it is anchored to the tricuspid uh, valve. It's uh, grasping the leaflet and um, is developed in two different steps, one ventricular part and one atrial part. The size uh, that are available in the, in the study are 44, 48, and 52, which of course does not allow to treat uh, all the anatomy because some of the patients are, um, are even bigger annulus. And what is particular in the case we will show you today, we use also as an adjunctive imaging modality, we use uh, eyes uh, to show you a little bit uh, the, the, the possibility of this catheter, which is the only one uh, approved in Europe, the Siemens Akusan Akunav uh, catheter, providing not only one dimension, so it's not only a 2D uh, catheter, but also uh, three-dimensional images, and in particular a second plane that you will see during the procedure, and that is very useful to, um, to look at uh, the capture of the, of the leaflet. So Bernard, maybe if you agree, we can now discuss a little bit with Victoria the uh, imaging of this patient. We can all learn something from Victoria. I, I agree. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. It's really a, a nice case and very typical case that we can see in clinical practice because, as you have seen, sometimes the uh, tricuspid uh, regurgitation is tend to uh, be put everything in the same uh, place, but actually it's quite heterogeneous disease. So if we forget about what would be organic or primary tricuspid regurgitation, which is quite strange, then we have a kind of uh, mixed disease where we call functional, and in between, for example, uh, patients with tricuspid regurgitation related to the uh, presence of uh, pacemaker leads, which sometimes could be dilatation because of heart failure, but sometimes could be damage. It's not the case either in our, in this case that uh, Fabian has presented, and then we are really the true functional secondary um, uh, tricuspid regurgitation either because of dilatation of the right ventricle or because of atrial dilatation. Both of them, they are going to have quite uh, dilated annulus, but the difference is that when there is uh, ventricular dilatation primarily, you are going to have much more uh, damage uh, right ventricle perhaps, and here when we deal mainly with patients with atrial fibrillation, we have mainly a dilatation of the uh, right atrium, the right ventricle remains, of course, somehow dilated because we also measure the dimension always in, in the annulus, but with a more preserved function. So I would say this is the classification that uh, we had in our uh, PCR tricuspid regurgitation group, and it's very easy to uh, characterize them. I see what is very characteristic of that patient is the planar coaptation, so you don't have so much tethering. So that's really a characteristic of, uh, of this atrial uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Exactly. So you can see also in this uh, view that I can make it uh, bigger if I learn with this uh, smart screen. So indeed, you see here that the leaflets are quite planar. The regurgitant jet is quite central, and then if we do the transgastric view where you have the end kind of um, ventricular view of the tricuspid valve, here you will have the aortic valve, that is the mechanical valve in this, uh, the mechanical valve in this case, and then therefore is here more anterior, and here it will be more posterior. Here is the septum, and then you have more or less the septal leaflet. Here will be a large one anterior, and here it will be much more the posterior. And because it's so large, the annulus, you see that the coaptation is along the entire coaptation line of the, uh, the leaflets. They really don't come across, and then you have all this central jet in the, in the lack of coaptation completely. So probably there to try to use, for example, an H2H -H repair would be more tricky. And in this case, uh, replacement it would be a much um, um, definitive solution, I think. And then you can have also this view that also Fabian showed, which is the view for the 
um, selection of the patient. And in this case, you have the simultaneous color. This is a very deep um, evaluation in the mid esophageal, where you see already the entrance of the coronary sinus. And here you can see these leaflets, which are rather long still, but as he said, because of this atrial dilatation, the coaptation is quite flat. And this would be the biplane view. Here it would be kind of the inflow and the outflow of the right ventricle, with here will come the aortic valve. And here you are cutting at this level. And you have the perpendicular view, which would be kind of bicaval view, and where you can have uh, the other dimension of the annulus. Of course, that we can go to uh, 3D echocardiography. And I think that uh, your echocardiography much, must be congratulated because these kind of tricuspid valves are difficult to get on the 3D view, and particularly when they have an aortic mechanical valve. This is really challenging, and the image quality is excellent. So you have shown the eyes, the 4D eyes. It's a nice tool, but having such an echocardiographer, I don't think that you will need it. <laughs> and here on these views, you can have this uh, multiplanar reformation planes that is basically cutting the entire annulus where you could measure. Of course, uh, CT has a much better resolution. And we will go to this one, I think, better, where you have the dimension of the annulus on CT. And you can have the maximum diameter, and for, which would be much more posterior anterior direction. And here you will have more from the septal to the lateral direction. And you measure in diastole and in systole to uh, decide on the prosthesis size. So maybe just one comment on this, because you see the dimensions that are uh, written here on this, uh, on this view. So what you see are the dimensions just one, uh, five millimeters below the annulus. So we are already in the ventricle. So that's why these dimensions are quite big. But nevertheless, uh, this patient is a patient with the largest anterior-posterior diameter that have been treated uh, with, with that valve so far. So you see that we have a very large 75 uh, dimension of the, of the anterior in the anterior posterior dimension, and, uh, but that the uh, septolateral dimension is, uh, is about 40, uh, 54 uh, for a valve that is uh, 52. So we were confident with some preparation of the patient in terms of diuretic therapy that we would be able to, to get uh, contact with, uh, with the anatomy uh, on this dimension. Uh, Fabian, before we go to the video, just we heard this early with Stefan's presentation from TriSend1. The question of screen failure. You refer 10 patients for screening. How many are suitable for the Evoke device? So I would say in, in our screening for the study, we had about 50 of the patient, 50 to 60 percent of the patient that were accepted. So we, re we referred for screening about uh, 25 patients, and we have treated uh, 12 patients okay. in the study. So it's not, it's not bad. About one in four. But yeah, but the, but the, the, the main element for rejection are still the size of the annulus, because, uh, because this value is still quite small. But it's worth remembering that one in 10 patients for mitral screening were accepted in most of the, in, in, yeah. in the ongoing mitral trials. So we need, we need to put it in that context. Victoria, would you mind if we go to the case now? Perfect. Okay. Looking forward. Fabian. So I, I will show you the case now. So we will start with wire placement and then go through the procedure with, uh, to, which I have done together. For with the Stephanie wire placement, we will need to have a, a deflectable cheese. And then we will go directly with uh, a safari wire into the right ventricle. The goal is to place it really at the apex. Don't see, we don't see the... And that will be echo control as well. See, so we have an angulation that have been calculated for the implantation of uh, 36 RAO, uh, giving us the uh, tricuspid annulism plane. No. Oh. And we try to to put uh, the wire to the apex. We may have some, some interaction you see now with the subvalor apparatus, so I think we should come back. Yes, so we come back into the atrium and go again. 
Yes, that looks much better. So these are the baseline um, images we are able to obtain with eyes. The eyes is placed in the middle of the right atrium um, in a straight position, that's the home view. And what you can see is a 3D reconstruction of the, of the valve. You can see already the wire um, for the evoke implantation at the apex of the right ventricle. And you can also nicely uh, see the leaflet of the, of the valve. Uh, we will now put some Doppler on these images to look at the tricuspidal agitation. You can see that tricuspidal agitation is uh, at the central position. So we have now the catheter introduced into the right crown of the patient. What Stefan has done is a predilatation of the axis with the dedicated um, uh, dilatators. And we have introduced the 20 French femoral uh, delivery system into uh, the uh, inferior vena cava. And we are just at the entrance of the right atrium and ready to go into the, the right ventricle. So let's do this step together now. So I am pulling on the, on the wire and we will start to deflect now the catheter. This is the primary flexion maneuver. And we'll need to pull on the wire, as you can see, to be able to introduce the system. I will continue to give primary flex now. You can see a little bit of arrhythmia of the patient that is due to the wire at the apex. And then I will pull on the wire while Stefan is advancing the system. I will continue to give primary flex. You can see the steerability of the catheter. And we will continue to pull on the wire and introduce the system into the right ventricle. So we'll come back a little bit with everything. Exactly, to have a more straightforward position of the catheter. We have now positioned the catheter into the right ventricle. Um, you can see that we have a stabilizator in place. Uh, you can see here that we have the first flex knob, which is a primary flex, giving the deflectation of the catheter towards the right ventricle. And then we have the secondary flex that gives uh, the possibility to move lateral and septal in the, in the annulus. And finally, we have the death um, knob that gives us the ability to change the death into the, the right uh, ventricle. The whole system is still, of course, on the safari wire and is stabilized on a table, uh, which is at the feet of the patient. What you can, you can appreciate is that we have a quite central position already. The goal now will be to look at the separation of the capsule from the nose cone, and that's our indicator. Um, echocardiographic indicator of the height of our catheter. So that's what we'll do now. You may appreciate now on the fluoroscopic screen the gap between the nose cone and uh, the capsule where the valve is housed. The capsule gap, meaning that separation between nose cone and the capsule, is just below the leaflet in systole. So that's, that's uh, quite the highest position we could accept, actually. And maybe I would suggest to go a little bit deeper. So now I, am the, I have the possibility to turn on this uh, black knob, which is the death knob. You can see that immediately the catheter is going deeper into the right ventricle. I will adjust just to give the full range of movement. I'm just pulling a little bit on the wire uh, to be able to correct um, and give the, the catheter the final position. The challenge is not to start too low, because if you start to expose too low, you may be uh, trapped into the subvalvular apparatus. So we really need uh, to be uh, as high as we can, but below the leaflet uh, during systole. And uh, there will be a point of no return. So actually, we will do a timeout when we all agree uh, that we are appropriately positioned, both in terms of coaxiality, but also in terms of the depth. So maybe we are pointing a little bit too posterior. So there is a rail on this uh, stabilizator to be able to move the wall assembly toward anterior. The next step will be that we develop uh, the uh, anchors, uh, which will be a stepwise uh, process, where we first go to a 45 uh, degree angulation, followed by a 90 degree angulation, followed uh, by full uh, deployment of uh, the anchor. So we will do this uh, stepwise. You can follow this carefully on echocardiography and on the fluoroscopy. Stefan is turning the, the capsule now. 
and that will release part of the valve, self-expanding valve. Give a little bit more, just that. And intermittently, I also release the tension on the capsule. So you can see now on echo that we are able to see very nicely the anchors. And now we are clearly a bit too high. You can see that the leaflet and systole are on the um, catheter, on the anchor that are coming out. So I will add a little bit of depth by turning the black knob and then release a little bit of tension just by pulling the wire. So next step is that we go to 90 degrees. Uh, so I do the same movement again. I slowly turn clockwise and to the, release the tension counterclockwise. So you see this both on echo and on fluoroscopy. Do this slowly. And uh, you see now we are nearly at uh, 90 degrees. All right, so here we are. Maybe we can have a quick look on uh, on ice now. I'm just in the home view, and you can see very nicely in comparison to trans esophageal echocardiography, and we see the leaflet nicely. We see the catheter with the uh, anchors deployed at now 90 degrees, and we see also on 3D we are able to see the very nice centralization of the of the catheter in um, regards to the annulus. So very nice position actually of the of the valve. So Stefan is turning now uh, still on the white knob, the capsule knob, and we are we will be flipping the anchors, meaning that the anchors will come on the on the atrial side or looking to the atrial side and will stay on the ventricular part. You see that we are still very high. The goal will really to have the leaflet into these uh, these anchors so i think we are yeah we are a bit high so that's why the signal from echo as well and that was in our impression impression with stefan so we will go a little bit deeper i'm turning the black knob there so we have about now one centimeter added uh, depth and i will just do it that the catheter is expressing the movement i will pull a little bit on the wire so you see now it's nicely came just nicely, I would say a few millimeters below uh, the the annulus, the level of the annulus now, which is actually the right uh, position we are looking for. So we will confirm with echo, and we will do what we call a spin, meaning that on the multiplanar reconstruction that you have on the screen right now, we will be checking around step by step uh, whether the leaflet are really uh, moving on the on the anchors of the. Uh, of the catheter and of the valve. So what we should do now is to concentrate on the left upper image uh, on the screen and on the right side of the screen, left upper image, right side, and we look at this leaflet in a systematic way uh, for every anchor. So we have nine anchors to look at to uh, ensure that we really have capture in all for all these anchors. There may be some, some uh, exception, you know, if the, if the anchor is exactly in a commissure, then in that particular situation, uh, you will uh, see the anchor uh, outside of the, of the leaflet, and this is acceptable for one or two of the anchor position in a commissure, but otherwise, uh, you should be able to see the leaflet really moving on the anchors. But what uh, needs to be really avoided is that uh, one of the leaflet is pinned so th that you are pushing by expanding the valve, you are pushing on the leaflet rather than, rather than uh, capturing it. So that's, uh, that's a very important part we are looking at. Um, but basically, you are able to move the catheter and change uh, your trajectory in any direction to be able to recapture the, the leaflet if it's not well uh, sitting on the on the anchors. So maybe we can just look uh, at eyes. So I did not move that much the catheter. I have a little bit of retroflexion now. I think the quality is quite nice, and uh, you will probably be able to to assess the the leaflet insertion exactly as uh, with the same precision as with uh, TOE, I guess. So concentrate again on the image on the left upper part of the screen, 
and on the leaflet that is right on this image. And we are turning around for each of the anchors to be able to see if they are captured by the, by the device. So I think a nice demonstration of uh, eyes as an alternative for looking at all these steps. So now we are happy with uh, the position of uh, the valve and we would uh, now develop the ventricular uh, portion of uh, the valve. I just continue uh, to move uh, clockwise uh, the capsule now. What you see now is the separation of uh, the APCs uh, just uh, at the distal end of uh, the anchors from uh, the catheter. And that's uh, where we do another assessment. Now, let's do one more spin, please. So we focus again on the left upper quadrant on the, and within that quadrant on the right side, we do a spin of every single anchor, whether they are covered by the leaflets. So what Stefan will be doing now, he will still, it's still the same knob, it's a capsule knob, the white one. Uh, he will still be uh, turning this knob to further expand the valve. So the, the, this expansion step is uh, completed now and we will have confirmed with the spin uh, that we have capture of the, of the leaflet. So so we are we are now happy with uh, with the height of the device, uh, which we are checked. Uh, we just checked it with another spin. And now what I will do, I will uh, pull back the nose cone, as you can see now on fluoro, almost inside of the of the valve. There is a small locking mechanism. So now the the nose cone is locked, and <laughs> Stefan will now continue to turn on the capsule knob uh, to express completely the ventricular part of the valve. So you see how the capsule is retracted by my continuous counterclockwise uh, movements. And what is of interest also is uh, that uh, with the development of this ventricular portion of the valve, which you see nice on the echocardiography, there's absolutely no hemodynamic compromise or change. So I move back uh, this uh, capsule. You will see that at the end, it will land sometime uh, somewhere beyond uh, the left side of uh, the uh, ice catheter. That's um, that exactly the situation we were a little bit anticipating. Actually, the anterior posterior diameter of the annulus is quite big. Um, and, and it is obviously bigger than the valve. And what you can see here is that we have one of the anchors that's exactly in that commissure. Although this anchor is not capturing um, the, the leaflet there, but it's only one anchor. But we will try to correct a little bit, very small movement towards uh, the posterior aspect of, uh, of, the, of the annulus. Huh? So, so we come back a little bit towards posterior, just by moving the whole catheter. You see, that's already a bit better now. The aim is to have a little bit better contact towards posterior, knowing that we will not be able to cover all the annulus length uh, in that dimension, um, but are, have already contact towards the septum and lateral in the other dimension, which is actually the one, uh, the most important one for anchoring. Yeah, yeah. So I developed this further here. The, you see how the capsule gets retracted and uh, now we are all the way back. Good. So maybe we can just have a look at eyes now. So here again, now we have uh, fully expanded the ventricular part of, of the valve. Um, the atrial part is still in the catheter. And you can see that with eyes, uh, with, in that particular patient, we are really able to see all the details uh, we need to see uh, with the leaflet moving on the anchor of the valve. If you look at the 3D on the, on the bottom right, then you see that very nicely the anchor that are already exposed uh, with a leaflet on it and the nice centralization of the valve into the, the annulus that can be confirmed uh, with this uh, nice uh, ice images. So as soon as we get the okay from Echo that they are happy with the position and height, uh, we will come to the atrial development of the valve. 
which will be a two-step uh, procedure where we first retract uh, the capsule up uh, to the inner ring, which is uh, the dense radio-opaque marker you see close uh, to the uh, transesophageal echo probe that is crossing the catheter. And if everything is okay thereafter, we will go for full release. You are happy with the position? We can go for atrial release? Okay. So now I'm moving uh, to the blue release knot and I will do a counterclockwise, uh, clockwise, excuse me, clockwise um, rotation. You see how uh, the capsule further comes back and I'm moving this back to the inner ring. So I will remove the nose cone further and Stefan will then implant the valve. So now we go for full release of the valve. With turning on the blue knob and the valve will be soon completely free, which is happening now. So we will now remove the catheter as a first step and do our further assessments uh, uh, than when the catheter is out. Uh, the valve is completely released and we don't have any catheter inside anymore. So it's uh, the end result of the procedure. And you can really nicely see here with the ice catheter, uh, still in home view, I just uh, did very uh, small movements actually uh, of, the, of the probe. Uh, to be able to accommodate this, uh, this valve and to see uh, the valve nicely. And if we look with a color now, maybe um, we will be able to see that uh, we have actually a very good function of the, of the valve. And here we can actually not detect any, uh, any uh, PVL. We have a little bit of a more movement of the valve than usual. You may appreciate this on the echo images, which is not completely unexpected due to the very big dimension of, uh, of this annulus. But I would say that is not of, of any concern uh, regarding the stability of the valve. And Nico is showing now uh, the, the color images on it. And you see that we have very, very tiny PVL at the uh, septal part of, of this valve, very small and uh, of course not relevant for, for, for the patient. With preparation of the patient, intravenous diuretic therapy, we were able to, to treat this large annulus with a 52 evoke valve with an excellent uh, uh, hemodynamic result. For the wire place, that will be the case, Bernard. And I just want to show the, the name of the, the people who help us uh, in Bern for, for the successful case. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Fabian, and thank you, Victoria, for those beautiful uh, pre-procedural demonstrations of the imaging. Just, we've got time just for some very quick questions before we close the session. So firstly, I know you recorded this case two, three weeks ago. How is the patient doing? So the patient is doing fine. We have done uh, another assessment, a co-assessment, uh, after uh, one day. The valve is still moving a little bit, but we don't have any uh, PVL. So it was really a big annulus, as, uh, as I mentioned. But uh, I think the result hemodynamically is, is extremely good in terms of valve function. And the ice images were exquisite in terms of seeing the detail of the deployment. In principle, does it mean that you could do the procedure under local anesthesia with sedation rather than requiring a general anesthetic? So I think you're, for the moment right now, due to um, the, the limited resolution of the catheter that you have seen, uh, we will still continue to do it, of course, uh, under uh, transesophageal echocardiography and general anesthesia. But I mean, in the future, with, if you have some more availability of this catheter and also a better uh, resolution, that uh, could definitely be an option. You have seen that there was no any hemodynamic compromise during the procedure, so that's potentially something you could do um, in a patient uh, uh, in a sedated patient. And of course, the procedure was edited, but from start to finish, how long did it take? It, it, it's not a long procedure. So it's, a, it's about uh, 25 minutes for the skin to skin for the implantation of the valve. I mean, with the recording, of course, it was a little bit longer, but that's uh, potentially a very quick procedure. Well, fantastic. So, Jörg, the teams are on the pitch. The referee is about to blow his whistle. <laughs> Do you have any concluding remarks to finish the session? 
Yeah, so I hope they win. <laughs> no, but no, congratulations again to the beautifully uh, recorded case, also the explanation together with Stefan, how you kind of uh, together uh, explain these quite complex procedures, we have to say, all image driven, as we know. Uh, so I think we have seen aortic valve, new tissue on the horizon also will be seen on a transcatheter soon. We have entered the usual discussion like uh, patient uh, decision making in the middle age group. I think this is where the old discussion is going to happen. Um, and then we had a little bit of sharp kind of a uh, uh, movement to the to the tricuspid, but this is because this is where the magic is happening, and I think we all agree that this was a magical procedure uh, that the team from Bern presented to us. And let's hope for some German magic tonight. <laughs> okay. okay. Take care. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for staying on for the evening. We'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you.